Uh, just some ground rules and expectations. Um, as I mentioned in the sign up for this, um, you know, this call is designed as a place for learning and conversation. Um, our IOI code of conduct, which I will drop into the chat, applies. Um, we know that this is uh, a place where you know folks have many different opinions on that, and we we love that. So just a few different ground rules here of um, you know seeking to understand, not to be understood. Um, we're here to learn with you. Uh, you know, please presume best intent, um, ask questions to clarify as well. Um, and also know that we're happy to take questions offline if there's something that you'd like to have a deeper conversation about. Um, we would ask that everyone here be curious. You know, we wanna know what thinking this prototype has stimulated. Um, be helpful. We wanna focus on solutions to the problems identified and also be respectful. Um, we wanna build community, not tear it down. Um, and we are excited to, to share this with you and to hear not only your thoughts and your questions, um, but also provide a place for um, everyone's voices to be heard. Next slide. And with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Richard. Richard, floor is yours. Hi. Uh, for those of you just joining, um, my name is Richard Dunks, Director of uh, Strategy and Research uh, here at Invest in Open Infrastructure. And I'm really excited to walk you through um, the catalog of open infrastructure services. But I want to start off with a little bit about why we did this. Um, so when doing our research, um, it became really clear that there are some significant information asymmetries. What do I mean by that? So there's a lot of unknowns out there when someone's trying to find a service uh, to accomplish certain research tasks and want to integrate it. There's a lot of things about you know, which, what services are out there, um, what is, how are they organized, what you know, different kind of features about them that it's kind of hard to access. And in some cases, the information isn't um, readily available or it's not clearly presented. So we wanted to really address this in the hopes of foster greater understanding of open infrastructure services, um, what services are out there and some of the important features about them when making a decision, whether you're a funder or um, a, a potential user of these services. And we wanted to be able to cultivate a deeper awareness of how the services are provided. So um, the organization behind them, how are they structured? How are they governed? Um, how are they financed? How do they make, how do they do what they do? Um, as we, we've come to understand and, and, and believe that this also is, is as important as the service itself, right? And how the service is delivered. When we talk about things about community engagement, um, practicing open, um, uh, open values, transparency, accountability, and things like that. Um, we also, in, in, in doing this, we sought to prototype a means of standardizing these key pieces of information. I think it's important to emphasize this word prototype. Um, as with any prototype, it's not meant to be the thing. It's really a, a, a step on the path to the thing, a way to test out ideas and approaches and concepts and things like that. So um, that's um, meant we've had some trade-offs and we'll talk about those when we get through them. Um, but we went into this consciously being, this is a prototype to test out um, the assumptions, uh, hypothesis, and, and um, give us something to then assess needs later on. Um, to meet these needs of the various stakeholders that I mentioned, whether it's funders, providers in the space, um, and users potentially, and, and, and others who are, have an interest and a concern about this space. So and what we drew inspiration from, as many of you know, and are in very intimately familiar with, there's a lot of great research out there about these infrastructure services, um, who they are, what they provide. Um, we just want to call out particularly the mapping of the scholarly communication landscape at census, the scholarly communications technology catalog, open access publishing tools, uh, the values and principles framework and assessment checklist from this next generation library publishing project. Uh, the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, particularly when we talk about the governance side of the house, which um, in some cases can get uh, not get the, the fuller look that it, it may warrant to understand how are these services being governed. Uh, we drew a lot from those the POSI principles. And the uh, 400 tools, innovations, and in scholarly communication, the amazingly beautiful and exhaustive uh, list that is that's out there about these different tools. So um, just want to say, we're, we're not doing this on our own. We're standing on the, the shoulders of giants, and we really appreciate um, the this is out there. And when we've engaged with these researchers, they've been really helpful with us. We appreciate it. So I want to talk about how we did this work, right? So um, essentially, this data was collected from various sources, and we've documented this in blog posts, and we will continue to be documenting this as we, as we go forward, kind of uh, crossing T's, dotting I's about this, answering um, further questions. Uh, the starting place, though, was provider and funder websites. So looking at these services, 
um, and the organizations behind them. Um, I don't think too many people get into the about tab. That's where I lived the last six months. <laughs> like who, you know, these organizations, who we are, all this kind of stuff. Um, also the funder databases, the funder website. So who, who are they funding? And this is an important point I'll highlight when we go through the app as well. Um, we limited ourselves to verifiable funding. So uh, unfortunately, not all funders in the space uh, published their uh, the grants that they, pub that, they, that they offer, they award. Um, they'll talk about what well, we award to this organization, but not say the amount or any of the details about it. So we've really biased as an evidence-based organization to those things that we could verify. So the provider says they got funding from X um, foundation, going to X foundation's website. If we couldn't find documentation about that, you know, the, you know, the how much and when and things like that, then we didn't include it in this. Um, and we, we hope going forward that other funders will be more uh, forthcoming with that information. Um, and we definitely appreciate those providers who've, who've disclosed this information on their websites as well. We, uh, I spent a lot of time in annual reports as well. Um, these are great for those organizations that do that. It's a great way to get additional documentation, particularly if there's no other requirement for financial disclosure. So uh, some of it's pulled from those documents. Um, for those organizations, and we have six of them in our, our initial cohort who are US-based nonprofits, meaning they're 501c3s or 501c6s, um, they are required to uh, submit financial data yearly to the US Internal Revenue Service. And we have access to that data. It's open data and um, available. Not necessarily usable, it's available though. <laughs> Not usable without some, um, a lot of extra work. Uh, we also conducted, um, uh, we also did engagements with these projects. Um, we set up interviews with them and as part of the pre-interview um, preparation, we did a survey with them, gathering some information uh, that we also used in the, the application. So you'll see documented in there uh, self-ranking measures these come from that survey. In addition, the interviews were ways for us to really get some get context for the numbers that we had uh, to better understand some of what's what's going on. So it's it's great to have published, say, a charter or bylaws that say that the organization will do X. But in our interviews, being able to really surface, okay, what are the actual governance practices? Um, you know, is this committee still work meeting? Is it not? What are some of the challenges with it? And things like that. Um, and these interviews, again. Um, covered a lot of things, not just what we included in COIS, but we're really trying to get to these idea of the hidden costs, maintenance costs, like what are the things that we don't think about that really need to be when we talk about investing and supporting these services. So more to come on that um, as we move forward with that, that research. Um, so we're going to, I just want to walk you through, I'm assuming most everyone's had a chance to look through this, um, but I want to just take and highlight some of the key elements of COIS, as we call it, the Catalog Infrastructure Services. Um, just to familiarize you and, and hopefully kind of address maybe some questions that have, have come up. And then we can, we'll move into a Q&A session uh, here in just a few moments. But as you can see, we've really tried to, on this um, index page, have some documentation here that's readily available. So the information on who is included, um, the data sources, there's an FAQ section we just updated with some additional feedback that we've gotten since the release and our, our acknowledgements section. Um, Really briefly, just to kind of touch on what we what we covered in our blog post that went out last night and, and the expanded FAQ, um, we selected these 10 services um, using a criteria that we had, um, we'd begun working with in the fall and we published a blog post about this in the fall about that criteria and the services that we selected. Um, we tried to be representative of the, the breadth of open infrastructure services. So trying to, you know, for the different um, phases of research, you know, try and be selective, like pick a representative uh, entity service provider in that space, but also kind of break out of the North American uh, European frame and, and select uh, services that weren't primarily located in, um, in, in those regions. So looking outside the Northern Hemisphere and things like that. So um, we definitely did not intend these 10 to be uh, the ones. They're not, not 10 to rule them all or anything like that. Um, it's just actually as a, in a prototype, an opportunity for us to test our methods and approaches um, with various different types of organizations and, and test out our frameworks of understanding in this prototype as we work to expand and, and improve the work that we've done. So definitely want to emphasize that and we will take more, if you have more questions about that, we're happy to, to field those as well. But to take one as an example, um, I'll just take Crossref, it's right there at the top, the metadata retrieval service. Um, so as you can see, 
we have in here the, the service summary. Uh, this is drawn from, from their documentation. Um, we also included, well, most of this is descriptive, meaning we just basically took information that was out there and compiled it into a, um, a, a little bit more readily available format. We did apply a, um, an evaluative framework, and this is coming from Copam's research around transformative influence, community engagement. And really we're looking at the presence of um, these eight factors for transformative influence and three factors for community engagement. Um, and we work with the projects. Um, we, we created this and then interfa interacted with them saying, hey, this is what we think, what do you think? And got some great feedback from them on this, on this framework. Um, it's just a way for us when we talk about alignment with principles and values in this space, a way for us to, to, to surface that information in a meaningful way, we think. So um, it is it's still a work in progress. We started with nine, we're to eight on the transformative influence. Um, we're looking at improving this framework for usability and understandability um, as we go forward, but we hope it's a good starting place to begin the conversation as to talk about these elements. So outside of those, the overview of these, this value to framework, uh, and as I said, we, we tried to, the links here will take you to documentation. As with the community engagement, we have some uh, text that describes why we made that decision around the yeses. Um, then it goes into our, the descriptive element. So how is the organization, this organizational history, who founded it, the year of founding, affiliated inf institutions, a short narrative about changes over time, just so, um, for myself, I'm, I'm not from, uh, didn't grow up in this space. I'm not familiar with all the people. Um, I'm becoming more familiar, but this history lesson is important because there's a lot of that context that um, I miss and have to be reminded of constantly by my peers, which is great. Um, but to help other people know like some of the background that could be helpful in understanding this service and, and how it's provided. Um, we do have some simple descriptors of organizational structure. So we do make a distinction in the organizational model, a standalone nonprofit versus one that's uh, fiscally sponsored um, or has some relationship with an academic institution. And happy to talk about the conversation of what's a standalone nonprofit. We've had some um, recent instances where, you know, understanding that term doesn't mean the same in every taxi jurisdiction around the world. So, and happy to surface that information out and, and talk more about that. We talk about the current leadership, the governance, um, understanding the, you know, the board structure, how is the board structured, who's on the board, um, so that there is just, you know, clarity about the personalities involved. Uh, overview of the finances. So how is, how is an organization financed? Looking primarily at those that are financed primarily through program service revenue, meaning through fees for services or, or other kinds of um, uh, things that are delivered and, and paid for versus um, contributions, grants, and gifts, so primarily a grant-funded organization. We're, we're really trying not to make any kind of value uh, judgment about that. Uh, the mix of that is, is different for each, what works best for each organization is different. I'm very aware of that, it's very clear in the, leaders, in the, in the um, literature on nonprofit leadership, um, but at least surfacing that information uh, feels important just to, to understand these organizations. We do look at revenue and expenses, assets and liabilities, just some real basic financial analysis, just to understand again, um, how these organizations are, are, are being funded. The number of sponsors, uh, this is where, just to highlight, I mentioned the survey, the self-ranking importance measure. So looking at, for this organization, uh, Chris Koshreff, um, what are these, how, how important are these different funding sources um, compared to each other? So, uh, you know, sub, it's subjective, but you know, being able to tell us uh, from their point of view what the relative value of these are and understanding costs. And again, this is our work understanding some of these uh, under-recognized costs in running a infrastructure service uh, in the open science space. So understanding the relative you know, staffing of personnel, operations, and, and other kinds of things as well. So um, just to kind of round out here for the delivery tab, this is understanding a little bit about um, how is a service delivered, um, what technology does it use, size of the user base. Um, um, we also have some indicators of user involvement in delivery, how involved are the users in how we do this. Um, and another um, um, self-ranking importance measure around staffing. So understanding the staffing challenges uh, about 
uh, in, in delivering the service. So those are the elements of COIS. Again, it's a prototype foundation. We definitely want to build out more of this information. Um, as you can see, the, this, on the delivery side, especially considering how much the detail of like in SCOMCAT and um, other resources, we're focusing on the holistic view and less on the detail about the service, knowing there are other resources that are out there. Um, and we are, like I said, constantly working to, to improve the work that we have with this. So I'm just going to, oh, sorry. Uh, I just wanna close out with some grateful acknowledgements. Again, we mentioned these at the top, um, but the, the project leaders were extremely helpful in giving of their time. We really do appreciate it um, in terms of looking over the, um, the, the, you know, first of all, engaging with us, responding to the survey, making time for the interviews, uh, reviewing our, the data that we had right before the Christmas holiday when everyone's busy and crazy end of the year kind of time and, and really do appreciate it. There's some really a great feedback that we got as well that helped make this project better. And we really are, are grateful for that um, in this work. We also appreciate, we in addition to working with the projects, we also ran focus groups with, um, funders um, and, and they actually they also gave us some really great feedback on this that we incorporated into it. Uh, we we're also able to engage with experts in the nonprofit um, effectiveness assessment kind of field more broadly. They were also their advice was invaluable to us as well and we really do appreciate it um, and their guidance. And the design supports want to call out this was designed by Allison McCartney, very talented designer who was very helpful in making this kind of come alive and, and look as good as it does. If K or I were designing it, it probably wouldn't look nearly as good. So Really want to want to thank them, um, and just really quick on on future work, and I'm gonna pass this off to Kay after I talk about this first one. Um, we've been working through, so we documented through the blog post in the beginning about um, you know as we were doing it, trying to be transparent about our process as best we could while we were working. Uh, we know there's a lot of um, further technical documentation, and we're working on that now. Really, like I said, cross the T's, dot the I's, make it clear where things are coming from. Some of these particular like on the evaluative frameworks, um, be very clear about why we made one decision, you know, where was the line in this? So that's all work that we're doing uh, to explain that. So look for that in the very near future as we really, as we finish, as we finish the work of documenting all the work that we did. Um, and I also want to say as well that these sessions are invaluable for us as well to know what are the remaining questions, what things aren't clear enough that we need to fix or explain you know, if it's a bug with the app or it's just something that needs to be better clarified, you know, to make those changes and to present that documentation to the community to continue the conversation. So, and I'll turn it over to Kay for the grand vision on where we go from here. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Um, and also as a reminder, I just posted in the chat, the document again, um, there's some great questions and suggestions that are coming up. Uh, and we'll, we will make sure that we've got some time to, to dig into those and have more of a discussion. Um, I think one of the, the sort of biggest questions is about how um, we're thinking about expanding um, this work. As Richard had mentioned, you know, we went into this identification of these 10 initial projects, um, basically, um, well, starting with a scoping from our uh, Mellon grant that's funding this work around hidden, um, hidden costs for open infrastructure projects and wanting to ask a few questions and examine um, some elements to help us you know, understand a little bit more about you know, the information sources, about the communities that are served, about the dependencies. Um, you know, for example, if you think of the relation with DOI Foundation and organizations like Crossref, um, things that can help us better understand where to go in terms of building out additional financial modeling, additional elements to explore governance, um, reliability, technical dependence, et cetera. Um, as Richard had mentioned at the beginning, and I know we've got a number of representatives here on the call, um, we had a, a post from earlier this fall uh, about the project selection that you know, kind of um, hinted at the broader list that we have begun to pull together. It is by no means a, a final list, but one of the first efforts that we went through and our colleague Asura who's on the call led this work was to start to pull together as many um, publicly available lists of infrastructure projects serving this ecosystem. And e this ecosystem being for research and for scholarship as possible. And then starting to look at what sort of uh, criteria and categories do we want to start to examine? Um, mutually at that point, 
Richard also uh, began to start modeling out some of the financial components, looking at funding data and publicly available information um, by looking at a subset of projects um, drawn from the SCOMCAP project. And so we have at our disposal a broader list of project and the, the real work moving forward is to think through what does it look like to have sort of that phased um, growth of building out this catalog? Where can we streamline um, you know, the, the sort of information intake and take the learnings from the past few months where we had much more of a hands-on um, way of interacting with projects, conducting interviews, focus groups, things that um, we learned through that that we might be able to be clearer about moving forward to think about that scale. So that's the work over the next few weeks as, um, for the team and also for our, um, you know, our colleagues on the governance side of IOI um, to really build out what that plan looks like. Um, we are looking to have this be much more than these 10 projects. Um, they were you know, mainly a way for us to answer some questions and to engage with the community and start to see um, what additional areas we needed to explore. And Richard, I know for evaluating the information presented on the data sources, you've probably been closer to this than anybody else. Um, do you wanna speak a little bit more in terms of the sort of depth element, knowing that we're looking at sort of the breadth of building out for other um, services and starting to represent other aspects of the ecosystem? Um, you mean in terms of depth? I'm sorry, I was looking at the question right now. I was trying to read no, it at the same time. Okay. It was a fail. <laughs> in terms of building out additional data sources and um, the information that's presented here. Yes. Yeah, so um, there's definitely, uh, for those who haven't like gone through the 990s, there's a lot of really interesting information about um, cost in uh, breakdown of costs and expenses, as, as well as sources of funding that are in there. Um, but it's highly problematic to work with. Um, it's an XML and every year the schema changes. Um, so it's it's really challenging. There's a community effort to harmonize into a unified data model, um, all these, the various different vintages and, and make this data more usable. Um, the community isn't there yet, unfortunately. So we're in conversation with those people and, and, and the people working on those projects uh, to better understand how we might leverage that. Um, but there, there's definitely a lot of things there that could be very useful. And just to be very clear, right, being able to look across services in this area is a way to understand a lot of the trends, the patterns. It's not to call anyone out. It's to understand, you know, you know, ex that, that what one organization is experiencing as a cost problem challenge isn't just their fault in a sense, right? It's it's a it's a larger issue. It's a larger trend. Any kind of anyone who's doing any kind of technology services, uh, doing any technology that's publicly available, has to deal with patent trolls. The legal cost can just bury you, um, and so that's a shared cost that we could talk about potentially, kind of working around. But a lot of that surfaced in this data when you look at multiple organizations instead of just trying to like take a microscope to one. So there's that piece with it too. We've been exploring because again, we want to be broad in um, not just focus on the U.S. context or even U.S. and North America or U.S. and Europe, but um, the other taxing authorities and what data they make available, um, understanding the vagaries of um, nonprofit law. Uh, it's a nonprofit in the UK looks very different from the US. If they sell anything, then they have to pay tax on it unless they fall into another category. Like it's, and in, when you talk about things in um, Africa or other places, public benefit corporations are, you know, that's a much better way of going in a lot of ways. So. There's a lot of nuance to this that we want to be able to capture with data and, and understand where those data sources are and expand on our use of them. Thanks, Richard. Um, I can see that the questions are stacking up, which are really exciting. Um, should we shift over to the Q&A side? We can just let the conversation go from there. Sure, I want to flag just really quick if I can. Um, mm -hmm. There was a question about sources for it. Um, I know it's small, but if you look under the finance chart, it actually says where we got this financial data from. So I know it's it's kind of hard to see there, but we were trying to make sure that it was clear where things are coming from. So there is a source indicator for the for the data that's there. Happy to talk about yeah. if you take a suggestion for better ways of surfacing that or, or whatever, but it's we, we try whenever possible to to put that in there. 
Yeah. Um, and I know that we've we've been working to document this um, along the way. We are looking also at where we can bring together that documentation um, so that there's the reference point. Um, we tried to kind of share things out as we were going, um, just to understand a little bit on the on working to kind of standardize and streamline that um, data collection. Um, we had at the end of, wow, well, end of 2020 going into 21 and then 2021 and then continuing to build off of that. This originally started as a funding data exploration, pulling down information from 18 um, top funding organizations to see if we could get a better understanding as to funding trends and patterns. Um, so there's a number of other data sources and bits of exploration that sort of have come along with this with <clears throat> the catalog being sort of a, an example of a resource from that. But just um, to note that the underlying information that we've started to build out alongside of this, we aim for that to also power some additional analysis in addition to the catalog there as well. Um, I know, for example, um, Richard, the work that you've done to help streamline um, the information from 990s for US-based nonprofits into our sources and other ways that you've started to pull in um, annual reports and things there. So we are in active dialogue with a number of different groups outside of um, these sort of more traditional data sources and others in the sort of nonprofit management and effectiveness and assessment space about other uh, ways we can start to bring in and represent information um, that you know we, we had to make some decisions about just for the sake of time and getting this initial prototype out the door. So with that, I know we're moving into the questions uh, section here. Um, huge thanks to those who've added them in the chat and also here in the document. Um, we will be just a quick kind of logistical note here. Um, again, a reminder of our sort of ground rules before about being curious, helpful, and respectful. Um, this is a really, um, this is a learning space. We you know, like to work in the open. Um, we know that that also brings with it, you know, various forms of um, feedback and, and learnings. Um, and we will continue to build out some of the resources, not only on our blog, but in the frequently asked questions section on the site um, to help, you know, kind of consolidate these learnings and, and have those as standing artifacts as well. So with that, let's, let's get into the questions. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll kick things off looking at the first question in the document here. Um, in terms of looking at IOI itself to sit alongside these other services, um, we tried to sneak this one in before, um, you know, before launch. Um, I will say that, you know, great minds think alike on that. Um, we, are, um, we are very much aiming to, to further build that out. And I know that, um, you know, these are principles that we care very deeply about as well. So I would just say stay tuned for that in terms of how IOI measures into, um, into this as well. I, I would just add really quick to that. Um, the argument for IOI being included is one of saying that there is a thing such as social infrastructure. So while it's easy to kind of look at say Crossref or ORCID or something and talk about them as an infrastructure service, the social infrastructure is a little bit harder because it's not as quite as tangible. Um, and I think that's something as well that we're still trying to tease out. Like we would want to, if we would include IOI, it has to be in a criteria, like where we would include others like OASPA or whoever, like, you know, and again, answering the same questions you all are asking about like, well, why this and not that, or where would this be or things like that? Like when we start making additions, we have to be clear on the criteria so that we are, you know, as we build this out being consistent and it's and clear for everyone. But, but I also want to highlight that we did have a lot of conversations and um, Kay and I like revising our disclosures, <laughs> you know, and governance and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So it's, we, we are taking the lessons, we are dog fooding from this as, as well. Great. Okay, I'm just gonna keep working, um, working down this list. Richard, do you wanna speak to about um, information sources for, for the organizations and ways in which we might be able to pull those together? Sure. As I mentioned, we do have um, we, we do have source notes on there. Happy to include those and we and, and talk about that a little bit more. Um, uh, it's it's some some of these the data sources for finances. It's a little bit easier. Some of the other things um, they did come out in conversation. We did check or it's cited on a website or something like that. And maintaining those links is an overhead kind of cost to it. Um, but I I think this also speaks to when we talk about infrastructure, right, and, and preservation, 
we're really great about DOIs and tracking funding for the research products. But this at the back end, like overhead operational kinds of things, I think we're a little less as focused on persistent identifiers and some of those other things that we um, maybe should look at and think about how we manage that as we manage our research products. It's a great, it's a great call out though. Um, in terms of the, the next question, I'm just gonna keep going through, so keep adding. Um, Bianca had asked, you know, she really liked the focus on governance, organization, and financing, which makes it a very valuable addition. Thanks, Bianca, um, in the space. Um, do we envision when more services are added to add a filter slash search, search interface um, to select on those aspects? Yes. Um, Allison McCartney, um, who is one of the graphics editors at Bloomberg, um, we had prioritized uh, this in terms of post launch, um, just to be able to get out under the, the timeline that we were developing this in. Um, an additional search functionality would be terrific. And I know that um, these sorts of bits of feedback will be great in, in how we scope that and to what granularity people are looking for those search, um, search functions. So thank you for that idea. Um, next question, and I might hand this over to Richard or Sarah. On the overview page, um, would love to see a little description explaining rating for the eight items under transformative influence. In addition, the links out to their website and documents comparable to the short description under community engagement. Do you want to respond to that suggestion, Richard? Already in process. <laughs> Is that what you're typing? <laughs> do you want to vocalize that, Richard? I do when I can unmute my microphone. Uh, yes, so we are already in the process. Um, Assure has already like started that that work and we're, we're getting that documented down. Um, we did try and cover that uh, on the, in the FAQ just at a, at a high level just to explain it. But yes, we definitely want to go into more detail about it um, because we do want this to be a conversation, right? So where are we drawing the lines on things? So um, just to surface a, a, a for instance with this, um, when we talk about equity and inclusion, um, there, I think it's worth discussing what, what really means, what, what really becomes transformative. Is it just making a statement of principles or is it having a statement of principles and actions? So saying these are the steps we are taking in this. And is it sufficient just to say, well, we're inclusive um, by default. We're just, we, we take all comers or uh, we're actually going out and we're recruiting people from diverse backgrounds. We're taking proactive measures to really engage with diverse populations and communities. I think there is a distinction worth making, and but I want to, I think we need to be inclusive of everyone in making this decision about what's inclusion <laughs> with this and, and be very transparent about it. So again, we were trying to apply consistent frameworks so that no one feels singled out or anything like this. We want to have something where we can start comparing across different organizations, as people mentioned, different stages and sizes and missions and orientations and things like that, but have some consistent evaluative framework uh, to really understand um, the role in the space and areas that are doing well, maybe need some improvement, better alignment um, with, with our values as a community. Thank you for that. Um, we've got a, a number of plus ones to the question that Irina had posted in the chat. Um, was wondering why we have DSpace and we don't have, for example, Dataverse, ePrints, Fedora, Haplo, Islandora, Sembera, and why we have Zenodo but not Invenio that Zenodo is based on. Richard, do you want to answer this one? I'm also happy. Yeah, we, we had that again. conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, again, it's it's really hard because. We some of these arguments again for a prototype, it was somewhat arbitrary and just saying like, well, we'll take one and not the other. It we weren't mm -hmm. focused on completeness. There was no intention of that. Uh, we were just trying to find a representative. And again, there's good yeah. arguments for every single one of those. Um, we couldn't have included all of them with the Zenodo, Zenodo and Nvidia RDM. Um, it's an interesting question, and again, this speaks to the level of awareness and transparency about you know when we talk about infrastructure it's a challenge to talk about what's the tool and what's the infrastructure. So for example, right, you have roads and you have asphalt. <laughs> roads are the infrastructure, asphalt is what makes the roads happen. So what's the real infrastructure there? Really we wanna focus on the roads and not the asphalt. I'm not certain that that's an apt thing for Invenio and Zenodo, but it is one of the, 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 the ways in which we tried to look at this to make those, those, those arguments. So. Happy to explore more into that, understand it a little bit more and, and assess that. 
But again, when we talk about infrastructure, I think it's really important to be able to distinguish the tool from the infrastructure, just in the same way, that, you know, some, is it a service or a feature? There's, there, there's a necessary distinction to be made. I would just add to that, um, just to reiterate, because I know that this question has come up about, you know, why one project was included for launch, why another project wasn't included for launch. I mean, we did go into this with some research questions, um, as has been noted, for example, you know, the reach and, you know, represented um, institutions for a service or communities that might be served. So we had, you know, Makutu and DSpace has quite a global presence, um, install base, uh, the questions around Zenodo in, in comparison to Invenio, um, we did have to make a decision there, but we also learned about their governance structure by engaging with members of both of those teams um, and, and other sorts of elements like that. Why we chose OSF preprints, not open science framework in comparison to open journal systems, et cetera. Um, you know, and I think the other thing just to note is um, the, we did have multiple sort of check-in points with the IOI steering committee about the frames as this was moving forward about our selection of cross projects, also went in front of our community oversight committee and others um, to kind of make sure that we were doing this in the open saying, these are the projects we're gonna initially focus on. These are the things that we'd like to get some more information. And the other thing to note too, is that for some of some of the projects, um, I would say much more sort of in the minority, some of the um, questions we had was about information that may not have been made public or may not have been easily findable, um, that we wanted an opportunity to, you know, engage with the membership of the leadership teams for these projects in a dialogue. And I think that that's a really, um, necessary element here, um, ensuring that we are, you know, having those open conversations and talking about it, questions we have. And um, we are very grateful for the individuals who participated in this process because they were extremely forthcoming and generous um, with their time and also with that of their teams too. Um, but I will say that the dependency component is something that we're really interested in for future iterations of this um, in terms of um, Zenodo and Invenio. And, um, you know, for example, I see someone typing about Crossref and the handle system. Um, one of the reasons that we were really interested in reaching out to the folks behind the DOI Foundation, and I know Ed Pence is here on the call too and um, has been heavily involved in that too, um, was to also better understand some of the organizations behind that. Um, you know, there are questions we have in terms of board representation, organizations, how, um, you know, what the support relationship might look like among different groups that I think will fuel our, um, actually, I know it will fuel our um, analysis moving forward as well. Okay, time scale for expanding the catalog to include other services. I'm going to hand that to Richard. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I think actually if, if I can take the next two questions together, cause I think these are intimately related. Um, if, if I had to compare what we did with this prototype to like a manufacturing process, this is the artisanal, like hand, like carved, you know, chisel and hammer of a thing that is just not, cannot be mass produced. So we, we really need to get a much better process in place internally. Now that we've sifted through what is useful, what isn't, how do we manage this information and how do we collect it? How do we manage it? How do we surface it? So a lot of those elements are now set and now it's the pipeline. We need to create our own infrastructure internally to handle this. Um, we're going into our strategy retreats and planning out our um, uh, you know, resourcing and goals and all that kind of stuff to be able to answer that question. Uh, what I will say, we wanna move soon, but we wanna move in a sustainable way. So, um, and and, and not only sustainable for us, but sustainable for the projects, the, pro the providers that are doing this work. We, we, they don't need to spend a lot of time giving us information. You know, their job is to provide a useful and important service to the community, not report on information. So finding those quick and easy wins, the easy way to provide this information in a standardized format that's really easy to use is our goal um, to, to, eat, to lessen the load on all of us. And that's going to get us to be more inclusive of all these additional services that we want to include. Um, but also refining our framework for understanding so that, you know, we're really engaging with those services, um, that really do belong in here. 
um, and, and making those, those clear distinctions in a transparent, accountable way. Yeah, and I think in addition to that for the strategy for including other, um, including other resources, um, we would love any additional suggestions that you think might be useful um, for things that we should be considering. Um, please keep those ideas coming. I know I see later on in the questions Ed has made some um, suggestions around various legal documents. Um, keep those coming. And to the suggestion earlier about um, the data sources for each project, um, that also makes me think that building off of the elements that I know we had asked um, for, we had an idea going into this of some of the areas we might want to explore, and um, we will inevitably have a better sense as to what we might want to make sure is available or want to prioritize for the next phase of inclusion, which might help us, um, again, streamline that process. Okay, uh, you can see why the services chosen for the initial prototype were those that have already made it beyond, sometimes far beyond their startup stages. What can funders and providers take from this focus on successful services that will be useful for providers and services earlier on in their development? I'm happy to start with this, but Richard, do you wanna jump in? Well, I just, I, I think there's, I think there's an interesting conversation to have, have around successful um, because I think, there, there's different ways of measuring success. The fact that an organization isn't bankrupt could be seen as a success. <laughs> they're still also providing things. Um, but there are also things about like long-term strategy planning, accountable governance, um, you know, engaged management, all, all those other kinds of things that speak to success. So um, there are definitely some initial things about what we see are, are are good and, and what things, you know, attributes, qualities that we think are positive that I think are definitely worth talking about. And that's what we tried to surface in the transformative influence in the community engagement. But I do think we, we need a much larger, a broader conversation and, and definitely with the providers themselves, uh, not just those, you know, academics or, you know, those of us like in this kind of research role about what success looks like. And because I, the challenge is, are we just trying to replicate the for-profit commercial model with like a one-to-one, -one, like a service to replace some commercial, or are we talking about building an ecosystem and you know that's collaborative and 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 um, coherent with each other to provide you know that's that's resilient as a community and interacting with each other? Um, those are conversations to have, I think, around this idea of success. But there's definitely learnings to have around just understanding. What is it, you know, the difference between a board that's primarily made of non-employees from a broad cross-section of the, of, of the community that are responsible and engaged with the management and leadership of the organization versus an organization that doesn't have that structure, that has something different or, or operates differently or operates in a different jurisdiction? Those are good questions to have and, and surface that to funders when they're making their funding choices because they have a lot of control power, you know, nudging ability, just to have that conversation, which I think is really important. Yeah, that's it, that's a great point. And I think that, um, you know, we'll be kind of keeping those learnings in mind as well and how we can share those out. Um, I know we are at 10 minutes to the top of the hour. So I'm gonna quickly take this next one. In terms of a maintenance strategy for, for COIS, um, we have noted on the catalog that we'll be reviewing this on an annual basis, part of, um, our next few weeks of work as we're heading into our kind of strategic planning for the next year ahead um, is to also uh, think through additional mechanisms that we might wanna put into place with that. So I would say that um, as of right now for our ongoing maintenance, we are looking at resourcing um, to have someone who can help with this. Uh, we have an engagement lead who will be joining us soon, um, who will also be um, thinking about how we engage with community and also with providers around these contributions. Um, we have research and uh, additions to our research and uh, analysis team for this as well, and um, making sure that we have um, at least annual check-ins with project providers around this. In addition to that, there are data sources like what Richard had mentioned around, for example, we know when 990s are made available for the large part um, and making sure that those data sources are updated and that will be coming in our technical documentation as well. Okay, um, 
how would you like to see the role of this list develop over the course of, let's say, five years? That's a great question. Richard, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, five years, hopefully we have a, a system um, that is authoritative, is reliable, is um, consistent, and, and, and a valuable resource. So it's, it's serving a, a need. We're getting feedback from the community. We're pulling a data that, that you all and others who aren't in this room uh, want and need to make informed decisions, fighting this information asymmetry. So it means a broader catalog that covers more services. Um, it has the depth, the appropriate depth of information uh, on these different areas. Um, and has those features like Bianca is flagging about like filtering and sorting and, and some of those kind of search functionality. Um, so it can be a reliable reference source. Um, again, knowing it's, we can't necessarily do all things and there's a whole issue about how do we track up and coming services, things that are, are on the horizon or just emerging that probably won't be resolved in the five-year timeline, but at least being able to pull together what the community knows and becoming a centralized repository for that kind of information. And I would say for the role of this, um, also to note, as many of you have seen in our strategic plan, the um, aim, or at least what we were going into this for, was to, in terms of that informed decision making, um, another big chunk of IOI's work is to think about how we can not only increase, but better coordinate investment in open infrastructure. And so this allows us to also think about, I would say, in five years, um, hopefully sooner than that, about how information sources like this can help lead to that change and how we can start to measure that progress. Okay. Um, in terms of the question around OSF preprints listed as service in that OSF platform itself, um, hopefully we answered that above, um, making the distinctions based on available information that we have. Um, I, we will also link to a post where um, we went through some of the the definitions about how we went into this in determining service versus uh, provider as well. Um, we did want to focus on um, a preprint service just based on the reliance on um, those services and that stack there too, um, and look forward to kind of building that out further. Okay, Richard, do you wanna take this next question? I see that you're already answering around um, and you are requesting financial and other data from services in a standard and defined way, encouraging organizations to be more organized and public about money. Um, go ahead, if you want to yeah. chime in on this. I just want to highlight too, again, I don't think it's in anyone's interest to increase the burden. So finding ways that make this easier. Yeah. And um, I, I think there are ways of doing that. And, and if even maybe helping unburden in this area, some of the, the tasks around this, I don't know what that looks like. And I don't think it's for us to decide. I think it's for us to have working in conversation with funders, providers, and and our and other interested stakeholders just to make this as, as easy as possible. Like the worst thing is leveraging another requirement <laughs> on yeah. this, particularly like an unfunded or you know, kind of thing. Um, so it's it's working together to find something that's usable. But hopefully this centralized, you know, reference source is case saying you know, to to help you know, provide this information is useful and worth some measure of effort. But we just want to minimize that effort as mm -hmm. much as we can. Yeah. Um, and I know we're in the last five minutes, so I, I will quickly kind of answer these last two questions. Um, thank you all for um, sticking with us this long. So in terms of, um, Ed, this is a great question on governance about the various legal documents. Um, depending on jurisdiction, you know, building off, building our understanding. Um, and I know that you mentioned for knowledge on latch as a UK entity, limited by guarantee, one person controlled, you know, there are different elements there. Um, we are continuing to learn and, and grow our understanding of what these various models mean. Um, and we working to further build out our documentation for that to share. Um, I think that that's a great point as to where we would also love feedback from the community about models that might be employed. Um, and I know that even, for example, looking at um, Zenodo and Invenio and um, governance and how that's structured in that, in that context um, was a, a very enlightening experience. So I would say yes, and watch this space as we continue to learn on that side. And then in terms of ongoing, uh, including the ability 
to have ongoing work marked from the provider. You know, we don't have X property now, but we're working on that. That's a great suggestion. I will say that for this um, initial prototype, and you can find this in our FAQ where we went through exactly what we um, were looking for, or at least more description about what we were looking for to qualify for say a yes uh, or a partial um, for evidence. I think one of the things that we want to make sure and, and that we hold as a kind of a core principle is also the accountability. Um, so we had a very active conversation with the providers for this process about, you know, it's entirely okay to say we don't have this now, but we're working on it and we're happy to update it when that's there. Um, but also wanting to not, um, you know, lead to people being misinformed by saying that something does exist or is on the horizon and then doesn't um, necessarily get followed through on for, in many cases, you know, entirely um, well-intentioned reasons. And so um, that's something that we're gonna be taking forward into our work thinking through the next phase about how we can best flag that and what, again, that reporting mechanism and accountability as well. All right, and thank guess, you all I, I for just, that. Go ahead, Richard. I would Sorry. really end, end with this, uh, basic idea, these are complex problems and there are no simple solutions. And we don't think that this is a solution to this, this is a contribution to it, but understanding these are, when it talks about governance and um, the, you know, sustainability, viability, all these kinds of things, and these are really complex problems and there are no simple solutions. So, but these are the means by which we start working out the more complex and nuanced solutions to these complex and nuanced problems. And we hope we're, uh, this is a contribution to that. Cool. So with that, I'm gonna stop our um, sharing. Um, we will be further um, detailing this and also sharing out the recording and also um, the slides from this. And do you wanna bring us home and help close this session? Thank you all for attending. If you have um, any questions or comments, um, please contact us at catalog at invest.inopen.org. Um, and again, thank you for your time. Uh, we'll see you next time, I guess. Thanks again, everybody. Um, and we do have another session coming up later today. Um, if there's anyone else that you'd like to join for that, signups are still open. And otherwise, please feel free to reach out with additional comments and suggestions. Have a great day, everybody.